message and then a Resurrection Day focus message over there at Kusawati. By the way, thank you, uh, James, for arranging that for us and church for making it happen. I thought it was beautiful. Did y'all? Yeah, it was a beautiful setting, a uh, great day to worship the Lord, and we just appreciate it very much. Um, there will be time to time where we'll need to go to Kusawati, and so we're thankful that we have that connection. Uh, but anyway, so we did the Easter message, talked about you know, the new life that we have in Christ, the resurrection, you know, basically sharing the gospel is what I tried to do on Easter and um, did that. And so now we are returning back to our study of the book of Revelation. Again, if you've not been us, with us for a while, don't worry, you're not that far behind. Uh, we are going to kind of systematically march our way all the way through uh, the book of Revelation. And we're going to study it, you know, kind of line upon line, precept upon precept and you'll I hope we, you'll walk away with a greater understanding and appreciation for things that are yet to come uh, hopefully in the near future you know uh, of course we'll be out of here by then we'll talk about that when we get there uh, but for now we are we are in a section that focuses on the early church the church of uh, the seven churches um, John uh, received the revelation from God and is now been given the instruction at the end of chapter one uh, to share this with the early church, the seven churches, which were on kind of a postal route, what we would think of as a postal route. And he knew that by sharing these letters, they would go to all seven churches and obviously over time uh, would continue and we would find ourselves studying the very same book so many years, thousands of years uh, later. And um, so when we look at these particular books, remember he is talking to believers in the early church. They're dealing with things, believe it or not, uh, and I think you'll see this as we study through each one of these churches, they are already dealing with things that you and I deal with in the modern age. We think, well, we've got new problems, we've got new issues, we have to wrestle with you know, heretics, we have to wrestle with Gnostic teachings, we have to you know, deal with all those, they were dealing with that, all the way back in this time and we know Paul was addressing those things but we know also that when Jesus looks at the church walks in the midst of the early church he sees their condition and he begins to share some things things that I think if we'll pay attention are very important to us even today from all seven churches I think the modern church uh, can draw some key things that God can teach us about or train our heart about. And so we're returning to chapter two. We're looking at a church that could easily, I think I said this in the introduction about three weeks ago, that could easily reflect the heart condition of our, many of our modern day churches. And when we talk about the church, I always want to make sure that we understand that the church is the body of Christ. It is the body of born again Believers knit together by the uh, supernatural work of God through the person of the Holy Ghost. And so we are the church, really. We are living stones that God is basically putting together to form the temple through which he operates in the world today and ministers to the world today. So we are the living church. However, there is always local entities or koinonias, fellowships, where churches get together together and they begin to worship God together. Maybe it's the locality that makes them join together. You know, maybe it's a specific city like what we're seeing in Revelation, uh, the city of Ephesus, uh, Philadelphia, Pergamos, Sardis, Smyrna, you know, all these different communities where the church was. And so um, there's that locality issue that there's a uniqueness to the local body of Christ brought together. 
But we never want to get lost in the idea, think of the church as a building. It's not the plant, it's us, right? And so when we think about that, when he, when he talks to the churches corporately, I believe there are always some things that we as individuals can learn. There will be, in any given congregation, there will be those who are giving over to false teachers. There will be those who are maybe being led astray into a sinful behavior pattern or a, a, a wicked way of doing church. Even our religion sometimes can become like the Nicolaitans and, and we can rule over with a heavy hand and, and conquer the people and make them subject to us rather than to the living Lord. So even in the corporate idea, you say, well, I'm not really a church of Eph uh, Ephesus person. I mean, I love Jesus with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's who I'm. My ch chances are there are other things in this passage that might speak to your heart. So we always want to be open to what God might be teaching us as we look at each of these churches on an individual level, all right? The whole church may not be guilty of what individuals are guilty of, or individuals might not be guilty of what a church fellowship might be guilty of. Does that make sense? Y'all with me? Okay. So when we come to the church of Ephesus, I remind you that they were a church with a, what I think is a prime location. They were operating in a vibrant, very big city, even in our day would be considered a big city anywhere the scholars say from 250,000 all the way up to 500,000 people would have been in the community of Ephesus. Um, even though it was very prosperous, very big, it was given over to paganism and idolatry. It was in Ephesus that you had one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which was the temple to Artemis, or I, I think the Romans called her Diana, and it was a godless uh, idolatry. It was um, it was mixed of, of religious practice with uh, sexual immorality, all just a whole uh, conglomeration of stuff uh, that made up uh, the the culture there, and so they were full. These temples were full of lust-provoking or evoking practices. It was full of uh, flesh-fulfilling um, uh, practices as well. And so, you know, I think about the modern church today and how we're slowly drifting from gathering to honor and to worship the living, true God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are beginning to drift towards having churches that meet our needs. And when we get to that stage, we're not very far from changing what's pleasing to God to saying, I'm going to do what's pleasing to me. And before you know it, we begin to practice church in such a way that it fulfills our desires instead of honoring and glorifying God. Makes sense? We have rock concerts instead of church, right? You, you get what I'm saying? We have, we, have mega, we have mega personalities in the pulpits with skinny jeans and holes and all that because that's cool and that's what that's what people want in their religious leaders and all that and i just think we're in a dangerous place and we can even though we're talking about a pagan city that did that man we're not far from that even in the modern church today and so we need to be uh, very cautious and i think again i think we can learn a great deal as we study through here now i want to say this remind you last week i or three weeks ago i quoted the philosopher of that day, and I don't know if I said his name right. I probably won't say it right again today. It was Heraclitus, okay? I think it's how he said it. Heraclitus was a philosopher in this day, and here's what he said of Ephesus. No one could live in Ephesus and not weep over its immorality. That was the culture that this uh, church was set in. So you can see how the church wasn't focused on the Lord. It wouldn't be long they'd be drifting off into the culture around it. And we know, and I think I told you this a couple weeks ago, that Paul addressed the church in uh, at Ephesus, which is the book of Ephesians. And when he addressed that church, she was alive, she was vibrant, she was passionate, and she was just going, a guns a-blazing. And then when we get to Revelation, as we look at John addressing the same church, this church is in a spiritual crisis. Matter of fact, the Word of God says in verse number 4 of Revelation chapter 2, I have someone against thee. And that's a big deal. When Jesus looks at your church, says, I got a problem with you. And he says, because thou hast left thy first love. 
and he warns them, and we'll look at this as we move along, that they were, in to they were in danger of having their light and their influence totally extinguished and removed from her by the Lord himself. That's serious judgment. And we're talking about a church. We're talking about people who claim to be the people of God that he's dealing with here. And so I think this is a very serious warning. And it should tell us that this can happen even in the churches of our day. These people had forsaken Jesus, who was the fountain of living waters, right? And they had dug out for themselves religious systems whereby they could drink of themselves. The problem was, as the prophet Jeremiah said, they were leaky sisters. They cannot hold water and therefore could not satisfy them very long. So, Jeremiah 2.11, it says, My people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. And that's what was beginning to happen in Ephesus. It's still a problem in the modern church today. God's people are trading in the power of the Spirit, genuine worship before God in truth. And they're trading all of that, the true glory which belongs to God, in order to have a little bit of the entertainment and uh, titillation of the world around us. So I think it's just a shame, don't you? And it's still a shame today when it happens, especially when Psalm 81, verse 10, God says, Open wide thy mouth, and I will fill it. That's God's promise to us. So a couple of things I want to look at in this text. That, um, and this is how we'll outline uh, verse number 1 through verse number 7. Verse number 1 through 3, I'm going to entitle that, The Church Dutifully Expressed. The church dutifully expressed is verse number one through three. Going about business, going through the motions, being faithful to the word, all of that stuff. Dutifully expressed, which leads to, in verse number four and five, the church feebly extended. The church feebly extended. When we leave our first love, when we stop drinking from the fountain of living waters, we no longer have a source that gives us spiritual power. And when we no longer have Jesus as our source of power as a church, we become a church that can only extend itself in some feeble manner. And then we have to adopt the practices of the world, right? Because we no longer have the amen or the power of God in our ministry. So we have to kind of come up with some other way of you know getting people in the doors and then the third thing we're going to talk about is the church and its fortunate opportunity the church and its fortunate opportunity those are the three main points that's your one two and three in the outline you have in your uh, book we will not cut or in your uh, bulletin we will not cover all of that this morning but we'll get the first one maybe okay we'll just see how we how we go as we go along so open your copy of God's Word to Revelation chapter 2. We're looking at verse number 1. I'm going to read all the way through the chapter, then we'll come back and we'll start taking it apart. It says, Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now we've already had those two terms kind of identified in chapter 1, right? Towards the end of the chapter, he says the seven golden candlesticks are the churches and the seven stars are the messengers to the churches. Okay? So we've already had those two ideas um, defined for us. He says, I know thy works. And you want to mark, you want to just kind of keep this in your mind. I know thy works, thy labor, and thy patience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. So that's good, right? And thou hast tried them that say they are apostles. So listen, there are teachings out there that the apostles did not teach, but others claimed apostolic authority. And so when they would come to the church and say, we have a word from God, they say, oh, no, no, no. That's not true. That's not the word of God. So he says, are apostles and are not, and has found them to be liars, and has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. So he kind of is encouraging to him, I know you're busy, I know you're active, and I know all this stuff, but I still 
Say you got a problem. He says, because thou hast left thy first love. Now, what is the first and greatest commandment according, a commandment according to Jesus? We are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all our soul and all of our strength and all our might, right? And so when you leave your first love, there's a problem. And, and if we leave the first love, I think the idea is that the heart of ministry is gone. The source of ministry, its power, and, and the resources available are no longer available to you because you've left your first love upon whom the church is built anyway, Jesus himself. Anyway, it goes on in verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. The idea is to change your mind. You recognize you've gone the wrong way. You feel the moral compunction. You feel the guilt of it, and you want to you go back. You want to reconsider what you've been doing and change your ways. It's, it's the whole idea of that word, repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. Well, this is staggering, right? This is Jesus talking to his people. Kind of like the Old Testament, when God is so sharp with the Old Testament uh, people of Israel. He says, I will come unto thee, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his, or his, play, or his place, except thou what? Repent, reconsider what you're doing, the way you're going, the fact that you've left your first love. He says, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Notice he didn't say, you hate the Nicolaitans. He said, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now notice this, which I also, there are some things God hates, all right? And then he goes on, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, I'm going to teach through this passage, hopefully very systematically, and in a, hopefully a very precise manner. But before we do that, because I'm not going to get to this, I want to just mention who an overcomer is. All right? So while you're sitting there, turn to, since you have nothing else to do, right? I want you to turn over to 1 John chapter 5. And I want you to look at what the Bible says about an overcomer, because there are those who misrepresent this verse in Revelation and teach it in such a way that it, you would think that you earn your way into heaven, right? And so they sort of twist it a little bit. He that overcometh. And if you'll just work, and if you'll just overcome the world, if you'll just live right and do right, and all, then you'll get to go to heaven, right? But the Bible has a different definition for what an overcomer is, who they are. And I want to just tell you right up front, they are people of faith. And when I say faith, I'm not talking about blind faith. I'm not talking about pagan faith. I'm not even talking about religious faith. I'm talking about people who believe that there is a God and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11 and verse number 6. People of faith, people who are persuaded by the truth of God's word and they live it out. Those people overcome. But the point isn't that you overcome in your own strength. The point is that when you have faith in God, you know that he's the one in you, according to Philippians 2, verse 13, both working to will and to do his own good pleasure. Amen. So when you are convinced in your mind that God will reward you as you pursue him and as you seek him, that's, that's your faith. That's, that's the persuasion that you have. And out of that persuasion, you begin to act and respond and make decisions in a way that's honoring and glorifying to him because he leads you in that direction, right? You're not on your own. That's what I'm getting at. All right, so let's go back. Let's just read this because it makes it very clear who an overcomer is because sometimes we want to add a little too much to it. Verse four, for whatsoever is born of God, whatsoever is born of God, 
overcometh the world. Amen. Right? So if you are a born-again believer, if you have entrusted yourself to Jesus Christ, the only way of salvation, you are an overcomer, right? Amen. The victory is yours. God does want you to walk victorious day to day, but ultimately, in the end, you will overcome this world and you will be able to live in the righteousness of God's presence forever. So in a sense, you've already overcome the world. The victory is yours. And then he goes on and defines it a little bit. He says, this is the victory that overcometh the world. Now this, this is, to me, fascinating. He brings it down. He makes it so simple. Who is he that hath victory over the world? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, when I conquer my alcoholism, then I have victory. When I conquer my, you know, other lusts in my flesh. Then I have victory. When I overcome my eating problem, then I then I have victory. When I when I become not so religiously bound but spiritually alive, then I'm an overcomer. And, and isn't it interesting that he brings it down and he says, "Here's the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith." Amen. Faith. And again, this word faith, and I, I've been lately trying to drum this into your mind and heart because sometimes we mix the thoughts up and the word faith is the idea of a persuasion there there is just this there's this persuasion that you have in your life and for us as believers we believe there's a god he rewards those who diligently uh, seek him he's given us direction through his word on how to live now he has promises of eternal life in christ there, there's just a slew of things that we're persuaded about because of the truth of God's word, right? So that's faith. Belief is different. Belief is actually entrusting yourself based upon the persuasion of your faith. So you can see how people would say, I have faith, but never actually entrust themselves to Jesus and be saved. That's why they have so much profession, so many professions that seem to have no power in their life. Because it's a combination of the two. You have a persuasion built on the truth of God. What God said about sin. Yes, we're sinners. All come short of the glory of God. And, and then not only that, the wages of our sin is death. But then not only that, we also know the word says, but you know, God's been good towards us, right? In, in that he's provided a way of salvation. And that's through Jesus Christ. And whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but will have Everlasting life, right? All of these truths, this, this body of truth that persuades us is what we stand on, and that's what overcomes the world. You and I can overcome every fleshly lust, every worldly temptation and engagement that's out there because we are persuaded that there's something better in the end, right? And we're willing to to put aside wickedness of now in order to enjoy it forever. So, who, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Verse 5, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that, there's that word believeth, that's the idea of entrusting yourself, not just mental acknowledgement, but a heart decision. I'm giving myself to this Jesus. It says, he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. You are an overcomer. If you place your faith in him, right? Because he overcame for us. And so now we are overcomers in him. So I just wanted to clarify that. It's not really talking about works. You don't overcome by clawing your way to heaven, climbing the ladder of self-works and all those. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are an overcomer. All right? Then you have a ground from which to operate as a believer. So now going back to our text and we're going to start looking at this section of scripture and notice first of all, the church dutifully expressed. Again, verse number one through three, I believe the church of Ephesus was probably very organized. You would have been, I think we would have been impressed by the church at Ephesus. They would have been busy. 
They would have been active. They would have been influential. They would have been humming along. Man, there would have been a there would have been a dull buzz of church activity in this early church. But the dull buzz of activity had actually made them spiritually lethargic and sleepy. Now, a special note in this verse is that Jesus walks sovereignly in the midst of the churches. Not only then. Now, we think that we just get together and worship God and he's far off somewhere. The Bible teaches he's walking in the midst of the church. Amen. He's here now. He's here today. He's searching our hearts. He knows our motives. He knows our reasons for being here. He knows all about us. And it was true in the early church as well. He knows what's behind what we do. And the scripture says here that he holds the messengers or the stars in his hand. Now, there's always been some discussion on who are the stars that this is referring to. Who are the messengers? Some say these were the angels that were to give a message to the pastors who were to pass it on to the churches. Others say, no, that's not the case. It's referring to the pastors of the church who are the messengers, who brings God's word to his people. They have been called to do that. They have that responsibility and that privilege. And so I'm going to tell you, I personally hold to the fact that he's talking about the pastors, not an angelic being, because it doesn't make sense for an angel to bring to John this revelation, only for John to give it back to the angel. To me, it doesn't make sense. So, and not only that, the scripture teaches this word star in, uh, uh, in the Greek is angelos, or angels, but in the Hebrew, it's malaka, where we get the book of Malachi from, right? And, and I'm just, it was used often to refer to priests or to those that were called as God's messengers, like prophets, uh, spokesmen, uh, all of those things. As a matter of fact, Malachi 3 1 says this I will send my messenger. Now, who was the messenger referred to? It wasn't an angelic being there, was, it was a prophecy about John the Baptist. So, the word, the same word that we now think of angels, it was actually referring to the messenger of God. And so I'm connecting this to the revelation and saying that what he's really talking about when he uses this uh, to the uh, angels or the stars, he's referring to the messengers. And those are not angelic beings, but instead they are human pastors. And he, and he shall prepare, this is Malachi 3, 1 again, he shall prepare the way for me, and the Lord whom ye seek come or shall, seek shall suddenly come to the temple. Now let's talk about the Messiah. And it uses the same word, Malachi, or angel of the covenant. Uh, the angel of the covenant refers to the Son of God. So again, that's why I come to the idea that he is saying, I'm giving these things to the pastor and his wonderful job. And wouldn't you, wouldn't you just love this? God says, here's the problem I have with the church you're pastoring. Now you go tell him. <laughs> Thanks, God. Why don't you just tell him? Right? It'd be a lot easier that way. And we'd keep our friends, right? Uh, anyway, so back to this church of Ephesus. Notice first of all, verse 2, that they exercised unquestioned duty. I mean, there's no doubt about this church was willing to do what it takes, right? And Jesus, again, knows all about our motives, our thoughts, our passions. And this church was full of good works. They had great programs, I think. They probably had excellent intentions, but they had traded the best for something good. They had traded Jesus for works. They, their heart was out of the ministry. They weren't doing what they were doing because they loved God, because they wanted to honor Jesus. Or they felt the Holy Spirit moving them to do that. They were doing it because that's what they were supposed to do. It's what they'd always done. And so they kept doing the same old thing. And even though Jesus was kind of threatening to remove their influence, obviously they had, he hasn't been influencing their heart for quite some time. And they hadn't even noticed. They hadn't even noticed it. Right? And it, it just should wake us up to this idea. So I think if you are a tender of a First Baptist Church of uh, Ephesus back in that day, they would have had opened up the service and somebody would come to the pulpit and would have said, let me give you the announcements today for the First Baptist Church of Ephesus. Here's what we're going to be doing this week. Don't forget, you need to come because that's what we do. Right? That's what we do. We just come. And so here's the announcements and we're going to have Sunday school. 
Y'all come. Y'all come. And I, and I would ask this, why? And then he said, no, well, we're going to have worship services every uh, Sunday, but then we're going to have a revival on August the 15th. Y'all come. Why? Well, when we do it, we'll be successful. We're going we're gonna to have, you know, a fall festival, or we're going to have a spring fling. Y'all come. Why? Well, because if we do it, we'll be successful as a church. Folks, those are not the things that make it successful. What the church is, what has happened to the church is the same thing that happened in the early church. We have become uh, task focused. We've decided if we can accomplish the task, we succeed. We did it. The program was done. The fall festival was finished. Never mind that nobody got saved or that God wasn't glorified or even lifted up because we did it like the pagans do it. No, never mind any of that. The end itself is what makes us okay. And that's not what God intends. Every, listen, everything that we should do as church and as an individual should be to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. I mean, that's why we're here. We're not here just to do Sunday school. We're not here to grow the church just in numbers. We're not here to just get people to sit in our chairs uh, for Sunday school. Listen, we are here to worship God and to honor God and to exalt God and to glorify God. And when we do a fall festival, it should be to honor God and to glorify God. When we hand out water during the park or a festival of some kind, it should be to honor God, not to just say, check it. Checked it. You know what I've also often wondered? Why is it in the modern church the most passionate service is the business meeting? <laughs> I've come to realize why. Because most modern churches have left their first love. And it's all about doing and accomplishing. And in that, if I can accomplish it, if I can get my will through in those situations, to us be the glory and the honor and the praise. And that is not what God intends. And yet we will come to business meeting and we'll be passionate, man, like at no other time in our church experience. It's a shame. It's an indictment on the modern church. So this church was active. She was good, except she no longer had the amen or the blessing of God because she was no longer enjoying the person of God. Let me, let me, let me remind you of something. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 13, if you want to look there, that's great. you got time. Um, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. I want you to notice what he says to the Thessalonican church. Are, are you ready? He commended them as a church. And, and I want you to notice that he uses the same sort of phraseology. He says, I commend you for your work of faith and for your labor of love and for your patience of hope. Now, wait a minute. What is different from that and the church of Ephesus? What's missing? In the church of Ephesus, we don't have a reference to faith. We don't have a church or a reference to love. We don't have a reference to hope. They're just doing it because that's what you're supposed to do if you're a church. Do you get what I'm saying? There's no heart. They were working without being moved by faith with conviction that what we're doing has been drawn from the heart of God. And it is God's desire and will for us to reach this community in LJ for his honor and for his glory so that Jesus might be exalted, people might be saved and be delivered from hell and go to heaven and all of those good things. That should be our motivation. I believe that. I'm persuaded that that's what we're to do as a church. That's a lot different than just saying work. Right? It is, a, it is a work of faith. It is a work of faith. And then he says to the Thessalonians, it is a labor of love. In other words, it comes from the heart. It is filled with love, not just for our fellow man, which I think many ministries do, but it is from a love for God. That's why we do what we do. We love God so much that we want him to be exalted. We want him to be 
praised. We want him to be adored. And we're going to do everything we do so that we, as we labor, it's from our heart for him. Did you get that? And when that love for him and that passion for him flows through our life and we labor, then all of a sudden we don't wear out, right? I think one of the reasons we burn out is because we're working, we're laboring, and we're, we're doing everything, but we're not doing it with a heart. With, 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 our, with our hearts plugged in to the life giver, the one who keeps us alive and vibrant. And then the church in Thessalonica, it says, he, he commended them for their patience in hope. Their patience was endure, was anchored in the endurance that knowing that all things are going to be worth it in the end. It's going to be worth it in the end. And so I'm going to patiently endure, even though it's very difficult at times. So, so Paul is commending the Thessalonians because their heart fueled their work and their labor and their patience. But when we look at the church of Ephesus, here in these first few verses, one through three, he said, I have someone against you. You've left your first love. There's no faith in what you're doing. There, there, there's no love in what you're doing. And what happens when the church loses its love for God and for fellow men? She becomes very cruel, right? I mean, can you, I mean, just think about your childhood and growing up in church and, and, and being told this is right and this is wrong and this is wrong, and this, and, and God's going to get you for that, and God's going to get you for this, without telling people there's hope for deliverance. Amen. Not only from the shame of the event, but from the condemnation that goes along with it. It is cruel for a church to labor on and to work hard and to get people to God only to say, God is going to tear you up. <laughs> you know, that's sort of cruel. You're giving them, and by the way, when the heart's gone, guess what we're left with? Legalism. Because when a person's heart drifts from God, you've got to have rules to keep them in line, right? But when people love God, and the whole group loves God, we can all move in the same general direction without a bunch of rules that says, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. You can just walk loving each other, loving God, and, and put aside all that religious, rigid, hardworking, empty stuff that never has had the amen of God on it. So as I talk about this church, you can see obviously it ties to the modern church as well. And if we're not careful as a church, it can happen to us as well, right? If we don't, if we don't maintain a heart for Jesus, a love for Christ, a love for God, and, and it becomes our will and not God's will. Before you know it, church will become a drudgery. It'll be dreary and it'll, be, it'll wear you out on every, every side. Now, I know y'all studied in your Sunday school class the book of James. And I know the book of James tells you that faith without works is dead. But here, I think John is telling us that works without fruit is meaningless. Works without faith is fruitless. And we just need to realize that. They're meant to work in tandem. They're supposed to work together. Faith drives our works, right? Works reveal our faith and our love and our devotion to God. They don't save us. They just reveal things about us. That's right. And so as we move secondly to this idea of the church, she first exercised unquestioned duty, and I don't have to pre time to preach on this, but I'm just going to open the idea up to you. In verse number two, she exhibited uncompromised dedication. They were dedicated to the truth, how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Kind of a broad term. This particular church, even though she had drifted from her first love, would not tolerate bad behavior, sinful practice, fleshly outbursts, immorality, immodesty, self-exaltation, lying, cheating, uh, pride. She wouldn't have put up with it in your life. And yet, she had a real problem. And the Lord points it out. So, again, we're out of time, so we're going to kind of stop there. Um, hopefully, you're beginning to see the power of what's just 
in these seven verses. And we got seven churches to go through. Now, I'm, you know what? I don't know about you, but all of my spiritual life long, all of my spiritual life long, I have always wanted people. And I haven't always enjoyed it, right? But I have always wanted somebody to tell me the truth. Isn't that what you want? Amen. And, and what I wanted to know is when I saw the truth and did not line up with the truth, I just wanted to get it right. And, and it's been that way all through my spiritual journey. I'm sure it is with yours. It's what led to me being in the ministry. It all happened in a revival back in Geneva, Florida, way back in the late 80s, I think it was. And, and God just began to work in my heart. Revival, pe preacher preaching the word, and me hearing that, and God just squeezing my heart and saying, hey, listen, it's more than buildings and pews and air conditioners and all that nonsense. It's about loving God and passionately serving him. Amen. And so even then I can see the church was struggling with this heart issue. And I believe that's what's wrong today. That's why the church has become anemic. More and more people claim to know Jesus. Everybody in America thinks they're going to heaven. Don't they? And yet, our society is more reprobate. It's more of an abomination than it has ever, ever been in its history. Something doesn't jive, right? Something doesn't jive. And I think part of the issue is the church has left their first love. I'm not talking about you personally or this particular fellowship. Hopefully that's not us at this point. But it's certainly a strong warning that it should never happen in our life, right? Now, as we close out, maybe you're someone here who has been dutifully serving God because Grandma told you to many years ago. Or you knew if you did, Mama would turn over in her grave, right? I'm telling you. That's not the way God intends it to be. We're not to do it from a rigid, dutiful, ah, I have to obligation. He wants us to serve him with a heart that is just full of love for him and for others. Amen. And so let's let him call us as a church and as individual members of the church. Let's let him call us back to that today. We have invitation. James, what are we going to sing today? Just as I am. And what verse? Oh, what's your phone? Oh, oh, uh, 306. 306, just as I am. And I want to encourage you. Maybe you're here today and you've not uh, trusted Jesus with your life. Why don't you do that today? We can help you with that. We can show you scriptures and just kind of help you along there. But man, it comes down to the Holy Spirit telling you it's you and that he wants you unto himself. Fine. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. <laughs> All right. Or maybe you're here and you're already saved and you know it and you'd like to unite with us in our desire to serve God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can come this way and unite with us. I need to turn these off, okay? So, James, come on up. I see this.